Welcome to our ninth event. Um, this is the last of this year's talk series, but all of the videos are available on our website. So with this, we turn to today's topic. Today, we will discuss what's next for space arbitration. And we will discuss this question, question in view of looking at the commercial and legal problems we are facing in outer space and see what risk management tools we have and what um, role dispute resolution can play in this regard. We have with us today Stefan Frey, who is the founder of Vioma, Cecile Gobert, who is general counsel of Exotrail, Girardine Go Escola from the Faculty of Law of the National University of Singapore, Donna Lawler, co-founder of Azimut Advisory, and Marissa Marinelli, who is a partner at my own law firm, <laughs> I mean, the one I'm working at, rather, at Holland and Knight. Um, I will introduce each of them during the talk, as, as always, and we will start with our first speaker, Stefan from Vioma. And Stefan is the co-founder and managing director of Vioma. While working for the Space Debris Office at the European Space Agency, Stefan has become an advocate for sustainable use of outer space. And at Vioma, he applies his knowledge to work towards a solution to ensure safe access to space today and for future generations. Stefan will introduce his company, what they are doing, and talk a bit about the role they see for themselves in, in the context of the risks in outer space. So Stefan, with this, I will hand over the microphone to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for, for this introduction. So yes, today I would like to give you the point of view of Yoma and how we would like to address the congestion in space itself. But first, uh, before we talk about how to uh, address the problem itself, I would like to give a bit of an introduction of what is the problem itself. And I'm sure many of you already have a very good uh, idea of it, but still I might give a different angle today. So what is the danger uh, that we have in space itself? Now, I would like to, you to imagine a Vespa uh, traveling at full speed. That's more or less 100 kilograms at 80 kilometers per hour or 50 miles per hour. Now, of course, you would not like to, uh, to be in the way of this Vespa, right? Um, now I would like you to imagine a single paper clip uh, that is one gram traveling at orbital velocity in low Earth orbit. Now, these two scenarios, these two objects are actually carrying the same kinetic energy. And that means that if you collide with either of them, you will have the same uh, catastrophic results. Now, if you're lucky, um, this, the paperclip itself will only uh, puncture a hole through your solar panel. But if you're unlucky, it will actually hit um, a, a more core part of your satellite and might destroy it altogether. In the worst case, it would even lead to the uh, generation of new fragments that will then be involved in subsequent collisions. Now, you might say, OK, there are probably not too many paper clips uh, in space right now. And of course, of course, you're correct with that. But let's look at the numbers. Um, so we see right now roughly 5,000 active satellites. Now, these are satellites that bring us um, weather uh, information or, or uh, GNS, so positioning information. But there are also military satellites and others, of course. Now, these active satellites share the space right now with around um, 45,000 objects that are currently being cataloged on a regular basis. That means we know pretty well where they are. We have uh, an idea. And it's also those 45,000 objects that actually um, lead the, to the active satellites to maneuver once or twice a year um, already today. Now, once or twice a year, that is probably still uh, handleable by, by uh, operations teams themselves. So you might say, OK, this is not really a big issue at this point. However, if we look at the total amount of dangerous objects that are currently in space, it becomes uh, very clear that what we're doing today is simply not sufficient. So there are two problems um, that are involved in this. First of all, uh, we simply don't see the majority of those objects. These are one million objects of the size of this paperclip or bigger. And that means we don't account for the risks currently um, of potential collisions between these objects and our active satellites. On the other hand, even if we would see those objects right now, we don't have um, sufficient information. We don't track them accurately enough um, to, to avoid unnecessary maneuvers. And that will mean that um, with seeing all those dangerous objects, 
our satellites would be maneuvering uh, maybe once a week or even more often, uh, seriously questioning the economic viability of the satellites in space. And then on top of this, of course, we also have a proposed uh, satellites, uh, planned satellites coming up. Um, there are around 100,000 that are to be taken quite seriously. Uh, many of them are coming from uh, the mega constellations that we probably all have heard of already, but also a considerable amount is coming from smaller companies such as Vioma, such as ourselves. So all of this is to show you that um, business as usual is simply not sustainable. And this is both from, from an environment point of view, but also from an economic point of view. So the increase of space traffic makes satellite operations increasingly challenging. We do have critical infrastructure in space that is very vulnerable um, and already today is suffering regular service interruptions. On top of that, the inaccurate data leads to a lot of unnecessary maneuvers, and that also means costly uh, avoidance maneuvers, even shortening the lifetime of those satellites. Or in the worst case, inaccurate data, of course, leads to collisions itself because we are not accounting for the probability of collision um, accurately enough. So from our perspective, then, what, what is the solution that VMO wants to bring in? And we are addressing this congestion in space through satellite operations as a service. Now for us, this has three pillars. First of all, awareness. We would like to map all dangerous objects and make satellites and operators aware of their surroundings. Then we also are going to increase the accuracy by increasing the knowledge of the state of the objects through repeated observations and improved modeling, we can reduce a lot of these unnecessary maneuverings. And finally, automation. Uh, we want to enable satellites to react, react autonomously to dangerous events and thereby simplifying operations also. Now, these three pillars, if we look a bit more from, from a technological point of view, how are we going to achieve this? So first of all, knowledge is really fundamental because it's, it's uh, a lack of uh, knowledge, a lack of information about those objects that is currently the biggest problem. So we are going to set up a large space domain data platform and are going to populate this with our own space-based telescopes that are going to observe the space population directly in situ. Now, with these space-based sensors and additionally with data sharing agreements with other sensor providers, we can then paint a very accurate picture of space that is being aided by our um, real-time calibrated force modeling capabilities, our data fusion expertise, but also improve knowledge on the characteristics of the objects themselves because we see them more often so we can more precisely estimate what are the parameters of the objects. And finally, with the catalog of objects that we're then building, we can provide automated satellite operations on top of that. So we can simplify operations with automated anomaly detection, optimal planning, and even automated decision taking. So what's the status right now of our company? Um, we have the satellite mission and requirements uh, completely defined. We are now working together with the satellite integrator to actually build the satellite, and we are aiming for a launch in 2024. We have uh, a unique space telescope design that we're currently assembling. Uh, we will test it end-to-end -end in an in-situ simulator on ground in summer 2023. We have already uh, many of our smart astronomics algorithms implemented and operational that is starting from the processing of the images up to providing the services to the satellite operators themselves. And already today, we have access to a global network of sensors um, that are on ground. And that means that already today, we can actually provide our services to satellite operators. And these are services um, such as on-demand tracking of space objects, orbit determination, but also collision avoidance services. Who are we? Just one slide on us, ourselves. Um, we think that we have a bold vision uh, and we combine space agency heritage, academic excellence, and of course, upon all, a drive for sustainability. Now, um, you can see here a picture of our three founders, but I think most importantly, we have um, built an excellent team of already additional 14 Vyamanauts um, that bring in a lot of expertise in astrodynamics, but also mission planning and satellite operations. So we are very confident that uh, us together as a team, we can uh, address the issue of congestion in space. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, Laura. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I have a few questions. So, um, so 
sorry um you, you you said that you you have a system where you can track um objects in space and you also mentioned that there are already a lot of avoidance maneuvers that satellites have to carry out to avoid these objects so to the extent that you're able to track more um, I would assume that there will be more avoidance maneuvers that will be necessary, but obviously a lower collision risk. Is that correct? Right. So if the uncertainties around the exact locations of these objects remain the same, of these additional objects that we're seeing, that would lead to a, a really big increase in number of maneuvers required. Um, however, our goal is really to not only uh, increase the coverage in terms of number of objects, but also increase the observation frequency and improve the modeling capabilities such that we can better predict where those objects are going to be. And this will then lead to a reduction in required maneuvers. And, and I think I would like to make this a bit more tangible by, by giving you an example. Um, let's assume I'm, I'm on a stage giving a mediocre presentation and someone in the audience is going to throw a rotten egg in my direction. So, Luckily, this person yells something, so I know that there is something coming. However, I don't see it because the lights on the stage are blinding me. Now, that means the uncertainty of the egg is actually where the egg is going to land is in the entire stage, right? So my reaction is going to be to run off the stage altogether. Now, with our solutions, basically, we're going to turn on the light, right, such that I can see the egg coming. So immediately, I can estimate the trajectory uh, and reduce the uncertainty to just a few centimeters. Now, if the thrower has a bad aim, I won't have to move at all. And if the thrower has a good aim, I will just have to perform a minimal avoidance maneuver. I duck and save my energy this way. Yeah, thank you. Actually, this makes it much clearer for those of us who are maybe not that familiar with the technology. Um, and in view of this, I read recently that there's a risk that because there will be um, different systems of tracking and calculations, that there could be a risk um, caused by the lack of, of harmonization by different systems. I don't know if you could say something about this. Yes, I think that's an interesting question. I would say the risk that we currently have is that everyone is relying on a single source of truth. So um, first of all, there's the danger that maybe this single source, which are is the, the US space come currently, uh, might discontinue to provide the service, and then we would not have a lot of knowledge out there. And secondly, of course, we also need uh, to trust that single source itself. So I think as soon as you bring in an additional source, um, or hopefully also a third source, at least you can um, check those sources against each other and make sure uh, that you have a majority vote. But I don't think uh, it will be a big problem because as long as we can validate each other's uh, results, we can actually fuse each other's observations as well and thereby improve the overall accuracy of the states themselves. I agree. And do you see any other safety issues other than um, the risk of physical collisions and the need for avoidance maneuvers that are currently happening in, in space? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I have not uh, had the time to go to this, but um, next to the physical space that is becoming congested, we also have to consider the allocation of the, the frequency bands for communications. So similarly to space itself, the frequencies are finite. Um, today, we have the International Telecommunication Union that is responsible for allocating these frequencies. Um, the problem is that it's usually on a first come, first serve basis, which might pose some problems for, for smaller companies that are late to the party. Um, that might be struggling to secure the bandwidth which they need. Um, I think another problem that is, uh, of course, happening right now is that everything that we shoot up will eventually have to come down as well. Now, it can happen the satellites or, or rocket bodies don't burn up entirely uh, during the re-entry, and that poses a risk to not only life, but also infrastructure on ground itself. And so I think in this regard, design for demise is, is a topic that we really should take uh, very seriously. Okay, thank you. And and just one last question. You you mentioned that you worked at the Space Debris Office of ESA. Could you maybe say um, a few words about what they are doing? Because um, it might be my ignorance, but I didn't know that they have a specific office dedicated to this. So I think it's this is very interesting. Yes, absolutely. So basically what they're doing is um, providing operational support to satellite operators um, with regards to, to conjunction analysis and, and collision avoidance itself. But they also do a lot of um, studies, for example, um, seeing how different uh, actors in space are behaving 
with regards to this space debris mitigation guidelines, um, even though they don't usually um, uh, name anyone directly, but it still gives a very good idea of, of what is the current behavior in space itself. Thank you very much. So we will now My turn to, sorry, thank you, to our second presentation by Cécile Gobert. Um, so Cécile is general counsel at ExoTrail and she has more than 22 years of legal experience and internationally, internationally recognized experience in the fields of space law, contract negotiations and insurance. In the past, um, she has been aviation and space legal and claims manager at Marsh SAS. And before joining Marsh, she started her career at the European Center for Space Law, where she studied the space protocol attached to the Convention on International Interests and Mobile Equipment. Um, she's the chairwoman of the Space Committee of the Société Française de droit Ariane et Spécial, Spatial, and a member of different space-related institutes, including the, the Institut pour le développement du droit de l'espace et des télécommunications and the International Institute of Space Law. She is regularly lecturing at French universities and has published several articles and chapters in French and English relating to, to legal issues in outer space. So Cécile um, will introduce her company, which is Extra Trail, to give a different point of view um, on how to deal with what's going on in space and share her views about the risks and how they can be mitigated. Cécile? Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will uh, share my screen. Here it is. Okay. Okay. Okay, I think you can see my screen now. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Laura, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, to this panel. It, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be very interesting, and uh, arbitration is, uh, is is quite a subject uh, for uh, for us. Uh, so, as as you said, uh, Laura, I am um, experienced uh, lawyer. So, uh, so I will present uh, briefly uh, what my company does uh, in in space, and uh, and then I will have a few words on um, uh, arbitration in space contracts and space related contracts. So, uh, to start with, uh, how can I? Okay, uh, to start with uh, the. Oh, okay, so, so sorry because uh, I cannot see my screen in full, but uh, that's okay. Um, so uh, the goal of uh, ExoTrail is uh, to develop mobility solutions uh, for uh, an agile space with the objective to become a mobility and a logistic provider. And uh, our missions are uh, threefold. Uh, first, uh, we want to improve uh, space deployment uh, by uh, developing in-orbit systems uh, deployment. Uh, second, we want to increase uh, space performances by uh, developing and uh, selling uh, reliable engines. And uh, third, uh, we aim at uh, reducing space pollution uh, by developing uh, in-orbit services uh, to, uh, for instance, move satellites in orbit uh, when they are at the when they have reached their uh, end of life, or to refuel satellites if needed, or, or um, even uh, to uh, take satellites back to the atmosphere. So these are our uh, three uh, main uh, mission. And to perform these uh, activities, uh, we have developed. Uh, four products. In fact, two of them are softwares. Uh, one is hardware and the other one is both hardware and uh, services. The first product that we've developed is uh, what we call the Spaceware, which is a high thrust electric uh, propulsion system. Uh, so there are uh, engines, in fact, uh, for uh, small satellites, and uh, we have different ranges of, uh, of thruster uh, from mini, nano, small, uh, whatever, uh, depending on the, on the capacity of the satellite. Um, 
And in parallel to the development of the space where we have developed uh, Space Studio, which is a software to design uh, satellites based on the needs of the clients and, uh, and the mission requirements uh, in order to optimize uh, the design. The fourth, uh, sorry, the third product is the Space Tower, which is uh, a software also uh, for in orbit operation, so to operate uh, satellites in orbit and also and even constellations of, uh, of satellites. And the last product is what we call Space Drop, uh, which is a, a service in orbit services uh, that we are aiming to develop. And uh, we have started the, the uh, manufacturing of uh, uh, in orbit transfer vehicle, which is called the Space Van, and we, which is due to be launched uh, next year, October uh, next year. Well, the window uh, is uh, October, uh, mid November of next year. Um, and this uh, space van uh, will offer what we call the uh, last kilometer uh, in orbit, uh, meaning that uh, the, 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 the client's customer cat satellites that will be integrated in the, in the space van will be uh, afterward uh, liberated in, into orbit on their uh, proper um, orbit. <clears throat> So our journey to, to, to become a mobility and space logistics leader was in the first step uh, to uh, develop the space studio, the, well, the, the, the software and the uh, engines uh, that are now and today uh, space proven. Um, and then we will develop the space products as the space drops, sorry, uh, the service in orbit, as we believe that uh, this is where the future of space is. Uh, Exotrail, as I said, and uh, as uh, you could have noticed with my uh, French accent, is based in France. Uh, we have uh, two main sites. The headquarters is based in, uh, is situated in, uh, in Massy, south of Paris. And uh, um, we have uh, some other facilities in Toulouse and we are roughly 81 person. And here is the happy team. And this is a picture that we took uh, two days ago. Okay. Um, uh, I, I want now to, uh, to, to say a few words on how we assess uh, disputes uh, resolution into space related uh, contract. Um, I will do it very briefly because I know that there are some other presentation um, that might uh, go de deeply into this, uh, this topic. But uh, uh, before to, well, not before, but while I was preparing the presentation, uh, I, I thought to myself, but uh, in fact, there is not so many uh, disputes, in fact, in the uh, space sector. And then I wonder why. Uh, and one reason I could see is that in the uh, space contract or space related contract, um, there are some provisions or some clauses uh, that are usually used uh, which prevent the parties to the contract uh, to, uh, to have some litigation. And those clauses, very briefly, we have, of course, the, the contractual allocation of liability, and we all know that in the space sector, we have the inter-party waiver of liability, limits of liability or exemption of, uh, of liability, which in fact uh, prevent uh, to, to go in front of courts or arbitration uh, to solve a dispute. But we have also what we call the best effort clause. Uh, we don't find this clause in uh, all and every space contract, but uh, in, uh, in some of them uh, where uh, the parties undertake to, to do their uh, best efforts uh, to reach uh, um, a commitment under the contract. So it's not a result obligation, uh, which prevents also uh, future dispute. Um, 
we can think also about uh, incentives clause or penalty clause, which will deal with uh, uh, performance of a satellite or a product. And where, for instance, either uh, a part of, uh, of the, the price will not be paid if the performance are not reached, or uh, the, the, the price uh, might be uh, increased uh, based on some key performance uh, uh, point. Uh, might be increased in case some performance are, are, are reached. So we can see that in the contracts, um, we try to, uh, to have some contractual provisions that would prevent to use uh, arbitration or uh, jurisdiction code to solve disputes. Uh, what I've seen quite often in the, in the contracts um, regarding uh, litigation uh, is that we can either use court jurisdiction, arbitration, and even mediation. I just want to recall here that historically in the uh, liability convention of 1972, uh, there is a process of arbitration that is uh, indicated obviously applicable to uh, launching states and so not to uh, private operators, but this is uh, some sort of precedent. And uh, this may maybe explain why uh, today we're uh, using uh, arbitration uh, quite a lot in the uh, space related contracts. Uh, in my experience, uh, the contracts I have seen or drafted uh, launching contracts launch services agreements, manufacturing of a, a satellite or, a, or product to be integrated in a, in a satellite or in a launcher, in the orbit uh, services, and also in an insurance contract. Usually we are referring to arbitration to settle uh, any dispute between the parties. Why do we uh, favor arbitration? instead of uh, court jurisdiction. So I've uh, listed here a uh, uh, few, um, uh, few elements. The first one re is relating to confidentiality. Uh, so the, the space sector is a, is, a, is a very small sector indeed. Uh, and uh, we are um, uh, using quite a lot of uh, confidential information, uh, either confidential for a company or uh, information that are considered uh, that have to be protected under uh, the, uh, an applicable regulation such as uh, ITAR or something like this. And uh, we know that uh, the uh, arbitration proceedings uh, can be held confidential under decision as well. There is a shorter settlement time frame. Uh, here in France, I am. Uh, I, I know quite well that uh, some um, proceedings in front of a court, uh, national court, can take up to 15 years, something like this, to have a final decision. So uh, it's, uh, it can be really detrimental to the to the parties to to take so much time to solve a, a dispute. Um, using arbitration. Uh, allow us also to choose some uh, experts as arbitrator, which is not the case when uh, you have a, a judge in front of you in, a, in court. Um, and these, uh, these we can expect uh, to have experts understanding uh, what is at stake and uh, what are the, uh, especially the, the, the technical uh, specificities of the, of the case. Two, uh, two elements uh, that uh, we can consider uh, detrimental from uh, the uh, arbitration uh, is the cost. Uh, often uh, the cost is uh, higher uh, the, in front of uh, when we use arbitration proceedings than uh, jurisdiction. And uh, we might have sometimes some difficulty with respect to decision enforceability. Uh, on a very, very practical point of view, uh, when we draft... Uh, Cécile, yes. um, I don't want to interrupt, but um, 
in, in view of the time, if you could summarize the rest of your remarks very quickly. Yes. Also, yes. I think there's, yeah. And yes. then we can come back to it at, at the end. Thank you. Okay, okay, no, no problem. Sorry, it's, uh, it's the problem of the lawyer, they are talking too much. Um, when we draft a, a, an arbitration clause, uh, it is very important to draft it in a non-ambiguous uh, way to be sure that we don't need to interpret it, especially in front of jurisdiction court. So I have seen some uh, problematic uh, arbitration clause. And, uh, and we also try, and it's quite, uh, quite important, to, uh, to use neutral law and uh, arbitration uh, forum. So this is the last slide. Um, <clears throat> first, upstream, uh, I believe it is very important to uh, set up contractual prevention of dispute. And then if it's not possible uh, to uh, discuss amicably and uh, try to find an amicable agreement before to go in front of uh, the arbitration uh, court. And uh, maybe also we could think of uh, developing mediation uh, to settle uh, disputes. And that was the last slide. Thank you very much. You. I have a few questions, but I suggest yes. that um, after, because Marissa will also talk about arbitration, yes. so maybe we can, after her presentation, we can go back to this and and ask questions to, to both of you. Yes. Um, so I will now introduce Gerardine. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Um, she is a professor at the Faculty of Law of the National University of Singapore, where she teaches international space law. She's also Deputy Secretary General at an international intergovernmental organization where she's currently head of a division focused on international commercial, digital and financial law. She specializes on the inter in the intersection of technology, policy and law, building effective solutions to the challenges our communities face by leveraging new technology and the legal and policy resources available at the international and transactional levels. Her work focuses on entrepreneurial and social impact opportunities that can be designed, implemented, and iterated with an eye towards long-term sustainability and inclusive dialogue at the international level. She, I, I also want to mention that she wrote a book on space arbitration, I think in 2007. So she is one of the main experts in this field. And she will tell us today a bit about the state of the international efforts directed at mitigating the space debris issue and, and issues we are facing in space in general. Jerry, thank you for joining us today. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. Laura, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jerry Goescolar. I'm a professor of international law at the National University of Singapore, as Laura has said. Um, and perhaps, uh, you know, I'm sitting among a whole bunch of experts here today talking about commercial uh, activities and all the dispute settlements uh, in relation to space activities. I've been asked to speak about um, space debris mitigation and orbital congestion mitigation measures at the international level. And perhaps before I do that, it'd be good to give a context as to why this is important. Just last week, I was at the United Nations in Vienna, where we were talking about national legislation mechanisms for emerging space countries, space nations. And one of the important things, of course, when we talk about the UN space treaties is this specific article six um, that requires um, contracting states to the outer space treaty to authorize and continuously supervise uh, any space activities of their nationals, including national private companies. For that reason, there are quite a few countries that have enacted legislation that require, for example, insurance, indemnification requirements, and so on, uh, in relation to any kind of space activities that these uh, companies require a, a license to, to operate. So these countries do not allow their nationals to have companies unless they get this license and this authorization from their countries. Now, obviously, uh, there are various different ways of legislation, um, but um, the idea is that it's important, I think, for everyone, including the uh, commercial entities, to be quite aware of what's happening at the international, regional, plurinational and national uh, levels in relation to space debris and orbital congestion. So I'm going to do the terrifying thing of sharing my screen now, and I hope you can see that. 
Um, so what's next for space arbitration? Um, perhaps let's take us through the in international initiatives and specifically I'll ask to speak about United Nations and the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Uh, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, we call it COPIOS because the name is quite a mouthful, was set up by the General Assembly in 1959 to govern the exploration and use of space for the benefit of all humanity, specifically looking at peace, security and development. And the committee was tasked with reviewing international cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space and studying space-related activities undertaken by the UN, encouraging space research programs and studying legal problems that could arise from the exploration of outer space. The committee has two subcommittees, the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee and the Legal Subcommittee, both established in 1961. It also reports to the Fourth Committee of the General Assembly to the United Nations. And this Fourth Committee adopts uh, the, you know, a, an annual resolution on the international cooperation on the peaceful uses of outer space. Now, it's quite important, COPIOL deals with the peaceful uses. Disarmament is dealt with under the Conference on Disarmament, which is a separate body under the UN. Um, now, obviously, the uh, UN COPIOS has paid particular attention to the issue of preventing and minimizing the creation of space debris. And every year, states and organizations exchange information on their space debris research at the Committee's Scientific and Technical Subcommittee. One important result of these discussions has been a set of space debris mitigation guidelines, which you are probably all aware of. And these were endorsed by the General Assembly in 2007. So we're talking about a 15 year gap since the, the actual endorsement till today. In addition to scientific research, um, the national and international legal aspects of space debris mitigation measures are being also discussed at the legal subcommittee. And to aid their discussions, there is a compendium on space debris mitigation standards, which has been compiled by the secretariat to this committee, the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, or UN USA. Now, at the request of states, this is made available through UN USA's website. So if you go to the website, you see something like 50 different national legislations and standards in relation to space debris mitigation, and already some in relation to the remedy of space debris. Um, now, of course, we are all quite aware that in addition to the ongoing discussions, the recovery and return of space debris is also a central part of the 1968 Rescue Agreement. And the treaty requires actually that states return foreign objects uh, discovered in their territory to their owners, and that they notify the Secretary General of any such objects. And so USA also maintains a list of such recovery notifications on their website. You have the document database there, of course. And what's interesting also is for the last couple of years, they've been discussing collisions of space objects, uh, especially those with nuclear power sources on board, uh, space debris. And the committee has also called for the continuation of national research on those questions. Um, now, the General Assembly is what this uh, committee reports to, COPIOS reports to, um, and I think two days ago, so late breaking news, two days ago, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution, uh, or approved a resolution calling for a halt to a specific type of anti-satellite testing, so ASAT testing, and this is considered a, a big move actually intended towards supporting broader space sustainability initiatives. Now, this resolution was introduced by quite a few nations, including the United States, and was approved on December 7th, um, together with a whole bunch of other uh, resolutions on arms control and so on. 155 countries voted in favor of the resolution, nine against and nine abstaining. Now, the resolution is quite interesting because it calls on countries to halt destructive testing of direct ascent ASET weapons. It could cites concerns, for example, about a large amount of debris that threaten the safety of other satellites. Uh, and, you know, in the background of that, of course, is the November 2021 ASAT test that, uh, that took place and which caused a, a bit of a consideration about what's happening. Um, because a year on, about a third of the debris is still untracked and still, of course, uh, in, in orbit. Um, What's interesting, of course, is that this is a UN General Assembly resolution and the public international lawyers among us will know it is non-binding in the sense that it does not require countries to halt such tests, but it does call to, from, uh, to, for them to refrain from such tests. And it might then show perhaps state practice towards the crystallization of a custom that uh, such direct ascent ASAT testing would not be permissible in the future. Now, in, in light of the time, I won't go too far into this, but I do want to talk about some plurilateral initiatives. Uh, and there you will also see on the UN USA website quite a few, but specifically, I'd like to talk about the Artemis Accords. Uh, the Artemis Accords is not a multilateral initiative, it's more correctly 
classified a plurilateral one, um, and it seeks to promote safe and sustainable activities in space exploration. So that's the, the, the broad perspective of Artemis. Um, but it also, while not dealing specifically with ASAT testing, it does call for countries that join the Accords to limit the generation of orbital debris, as well as transparency um, in space activities and affirming the use of space for peaceful users. So you actually see that the peaceful purposes kind of runs through all of these um, initiatives, and Artemis is one of them. Um, now, obviously, we have quite a few. I think 21 nations are now signed up to Artemis, um, and it's, a, it's an initiative that uh, is a plurilateral one, and more countries, I understand, are getting involved uh, with this initiative. Uh, now, we can't talk about the Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines without talking about the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, the IADC, um, and that gathers 13 space agencies together with, uh, which are national ones and regional ones, um, and um, they have the Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines, which then were passed in 2007. Uh, the European Space Agency, of course, is also one of the members of this coordination committee. Um, and um, together with the other agencies, so it's not an international thing, it's interagency. Um, these agencies are the actual implementers of the guidelines and these standards. So it's really nice to see that as plurilateral um, ob objectives as well here in relation to coordination when we're talking about space uh, debris mitigation. Uh, now, the relationship between the IADC and UN COPIOS is extremely important. Um, they don't gather the same numbers because, of course, we have national space agencies versus what is now one of the largest committees of the United Nations. Um, but it does gather in interesting people on board the International Institute of Space Law, for example, the European Space Policy Institute, as well as the Committee on Space Research COSPAR uh, observers at the UN COPIOS, and they then also interact there with the IADC. Now, of course, as I mentioned, some 50 countries have um, submitted their national initiatives to the UN USA for compilation. And today, just in light of time, I'd like to talk about the case study of Germany. Um, Germany has its um, its national space uh, program, which is operated and implemented by the Deutsche Zentrum for Luft and Raumfahrt. We call it DLR. Um, DLR has its own space debris mitigation requirements as part of its uh, product assurance and safety requirements. And these are applicable for all space missions projects within DLR's national program. Um, there are requirements which derive or refer to the UN space debris mitigation guidelines, the IADC space debris mitigation guidelines, as well as the ISO standards. Um, mainly ISO, I think, 24113. And these requirements are then tailored to specific needs of each project at the national program. There are major mitigation measures which are requested by DLR, uh, which include the limitation of the generation of space debris associated with space operations, limiting the probability of impact with other objects in orbit. So once Stefan's, uh, you know, when you put that together with what Stefan's doing, you actually see that's coming together quite a, quite a nice network of, of um, space debris mitigation um, and risk management um, measures. DLR also requires the limiting of the consequences of impact uh, by existing orbital debris or meteorites, um, as well as the depleting of onboard energy sources at the complete completion of mission. So a bunch of different um, mitigation measures which are required by DLR. Um, what's interesting is that the measures by DLR in Germany protect not just Earth orbit, but also the Earth environment air traffic and maritime traffic, as well as, as property. So they do look at it as a holistic uh, type thing. Uh, you have heard from uh, Stefan and from Cecile already certain commercial and private projects in relation to space debris. Uh, I just wanted to maybe just mention one because I was so taken by the app that they have. And that's Privateer Space. They have something called the Wayfarer app, which tells you um, where active and non-active satellites are. Um, and you can kind of move the thing around. So I'm quite a geek when it comes to this. So it looks really pretty. And I thought it was quite nice to kind of bring it up and show everyone this. Um, I, I think it's quite interesting because Privateer Space also points towards um, the safe use of outer space and sustainability, long-term sustainability. So they want to make Wayfinder an open access and near real-time visualization of data and orbital debris in Earth orbit. And that's quite an interesting project, I do think. Um, you've already heard Stefan speak about the sources of information that we have in relation to what's orbiting the Earth. Uh, one of the other uh, possibilities is when we have more sources of information to make it available on the distributed ledger using DLT, which is a trustless system. And therefore, there's not this question of trust that comes up. But to do that, of course, we will need more than one source of information. Um, and that's basically, I think, what hopefully Stefan was pointing to. To, and hopefully in the near future, we will see something like that. 
Um, just quite quickly, I want to touch on the work of NGOs and experts. And of course, a lot of people are looking at this, but specifically, of course, the International Academy of Astronautics, the IAA, has cosmic studies on this, on these wonderfully named cosmic studies, have looked and actually have produced two reports, one on space debris mitigation and the other on space debris remediation, so the remedy of space debris. Uh, these reports are available through the Academy, and the Academy gathers together an interdisciplinary group of people I've been very privileged to work with the Academy. We do get lawyers and engineers and scientists and physicists and commercial people involved. So I do think it's a wonderful uh, way for people to get involved uh, with astronautics and the protection of the Earth orbit. What I also do want to say is among NGOs and around the international plane, we're seeing more and more the acceptance of private entities and individual experts who do show up not just as observers, but as active participants in the work of, for example, the United Nations or in the IADC. And that's so important because without the contribution of private individuals and commercial entities, there's just no way this is going to work. So I'm really glad to see that happen and to see it happen more often. So I'm going to stop there in time, uh, in light of the time. Um, there probably will hopefully be questions not pointed at me, but uh, this is a really interesting subject. And uh, Laura, thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you today. Oh, thank you. Um, there was one question in the Q&A um, directed to you, specifically asking whether there are currently any efforts of trying to um, agree on a binding treaty on space debris. And maybe you could also share your views on how likely this is to happen in the coming years. So that's a really good question. Thank you for that question. Um, a lot of people are basically asking, we need to have hard law, right? So uh, kind of people are thinking we need a hard law, a treaty framework, something to bind countries. We don't have that at the moment. We do have negotiations going on for what's called soft law. Um, soft law, of course, is not binding, that has its drawbacks. But what's wonderful about soft law is that it does a couple of things. One is very agile. So it can move along together with technological and commercial considerations that evolve and develop. Um, secondly, it does show at the point of time that it crystallizes what state practice and the opinions of states, the opinion of jurists in that sense of what, le what is legal should be. Hopefully that becomes customary international law. Now, is there movement towards legislation? It's hard at the moment. But I do have some hope. It could just be because I'm an optimistic geek. Um, but I do have some hope on it for, for a very good reason. There is not just a stick, but a carrot as well. And that's where I think arbitration, uh, dispute settlement bodies will actually pay, play a huge role. Think about it. When you're doing any sort of space activity, the last thing you want is to send a multi-million dollar mission up to it be, for it to be smashed up into pieces by orbital debris. There is a carrot to make sure that if you don't do that, other people don't do that as well. In the insurance industry, in the reinsurance and indemnification industry, there's also this idea that you want to prevent these sort of collisions from happening. And the conjunctions that we can try and avoid by having standards would actually move it in that direction. So once we have the commercial uh, entities on board with these commercial ideas, we want to avoid liability, we want to avoid all of this damage, I think we will slowly move there. And then hopefully we'll see also the public interest in maintaining the environment, uh, not just of the earth, but of outer space. And long-term space sustainability means that we're going to have not just corporate social responsibility, but ESG concerns, which then lead to global good citizenship. And hopefully all of that points towards then that legislation that hopefully will come one day. But for the answer, the short answer right now is sadly no. The long answer is let's cross our fingers and we hope that it might come past one day. Thank you for that question. No, thank you very much. Um, I have many more questions, but I think in the interest of time, we will move on and then come back to them at the end. So I will introduce our next speaker, Donna Lawler who is a co-founder co and principal at Azimut Advisory, an Australia-based law firm dedicated to assisting clients who are engaged in space activities. She is a member of the International Institute of Space Law and a fellow of the London Institute of Space Policy and Law. Over more than 20 years in the satellite industry, she has been an advisor on numerous geostationary satellite missions, as well as assisting with establishment of launch facilities, launch activities, and small satellite missions. Um, and she will talk to us today about, um, con about risk mitigation in space contracts. Donna, um, I'll hand the microphone over to you. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can, thank you. Okay, I thought I, can you see my screen? 
Yes. Here we go. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, yes, I am from a law firm which uh, uh, I founded together with my partner in life and in crime, uh, Professor Stephen Freeland, um, the man of my dreams, who some of you know. Um, I'm seeing some smiles from people who know him already. Um, he happens to be sitting next to me. So if you see hear any uh, coughs or if you see a straight elbow coming out the side, that's probably him. <laughs> Jerry's giving you a wave, Stephen. <laughs> Okay, um, so our clients are, are uh, um, space companies and some of them are countries, um, universities who are doing activities in space. So um, Stephen is the visionary um, international um, lawyer and I am the grubby space lawyer. But it, and it's lovely to be sharing a panel with a number of other grubby space lawyers as well. So welcome to the grubbiness. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're going to be talking about disputes today. Now, for a dispute to happen and for people who are arbitrators to even have a job, um, something has to go wrong. So what could possibly go wrong with um, space activities? Um, I want you to put your hand up if you're not from the space industry. Um, okay, I... Uh, uh, of course, I can't really see you, but I hope there's a bunch of people at home who are um, lawyers who are putting their hands up, um, in which case um, some of this, this a big explosion like this might be a little unfamiliar to you. This is an event that happened, I think it was 2003, um, and it did, I am told, a, a, a result in an arbitration. And the arbitration... Uh, ended up going to the point of coming down to the point of did that rocket actually leave the launch platform by a couple of millimeters or not before it exploded? And it ended up being, of course, a, a fight between two insurance companies. And the reason why they were fighting about that particular thing was uh, it, it depended on whose um, uh, it. it who's um, risk, who bore the risk of that extremely expensive explosion? Was it uh, possibly the satellite vendor or was it the satellite owner? And was the, um, the, the I, I don't imagine it had anything to do with the launch provider. Um, and the reason why the fight would have been uh, around that, um, and, you know, Cecile, wave to me if you know that I'm, I, um, the story is slightly different from this, but uh, from the insurance industry, you probably you probably know even more. Um, but uh, risks in space contracts are managed very differently from risks in terrestrial contracts. So we all know if that had happened on the Earth, let's just say this was a, a building and not a spacecraft. If it happened on the Earth, we all know what would happen. There would all be a giant arbitration about whose fault it was. And, and no doubt the whoever caused that, who caused it and whose fault was it. In space, it's not about that, for at least for that sort of event. It's more about uh, time, who bore the risk at a particular time. And that creates a massive cultural difference between space activities and non-space activities. So um, it means that space itself is a unique physical environment, a unique legal environment, and also a unique commercial environment because the commercial conditions driven by the legal environment and the, the harsh space environment have created a, a very different commercial and legal culture um, to non-space things. So I, I don't have many slides, um, so, but I will just quickly go through some of the things to give you a flavour for the kinds of factors that come into play when we're talking about space arbitrations. So we've heard a little bit already from the, the wonderful other grubby commercial lawyers that have been speaking already. You're not really grubby, you're all very well washed. Um, but uh, of course, space is an area where that is beyond national jurisdiction. There are international treaties, there are national space laws that are quite unique and quite different from other, other laws governing other activities. 
partly because they need to take into account those international treaties and, and implement them. Access to space, as we've just seen in that video, um, is very risky. And then once you, so getting there is risky and expensive. Um, it's The cost is coming down, but it's still not cheap. And when you get there, it's a harsh environment. You've got radiation, uh, you've got massive temperature fluctuations, um, you've, got, uh, you've got space debris, you've got asteroids, uh, and you've got just the fact that you, you cannot, um, space, space objects cannot readily be uh, accessed for repair, at least till Cecile's company comes. Um, starts fixing things in space. But hurry up, Cecile, we need you. Um, of course, there is the whole, the fact that it is a dual use area, we've got um, export controls and ITAR controls, and that can have, um, create a, um, a number of interesting legal and practical issues, particularly when you have a dispute. Um, and as a result of all of those things, space contracts, as I mentioned, do manage risks quite differently. And I'm going to give you a really broad brush description about how it's done. And Cecile has already given us a little introduction. So thanks for the teaser, um, Cecile. Uh, okay. So um, because space is such a harsh, harsh environment and because you can't fix things once they break, um, the risks are quite high and the insurance costs are very high. So that, um, furthermore, participants in space missions um, can all cause loss to other parties in those space missions. So if you get something wrong on your spacecraft, you might not only break your spacecraft, but you might cause an explosion on the launch vehicle you might cause a, uh, um, a failure of other spacecraft that are involved in the same mission on the same launch. Um, so what to do? Because if everybody had to buy insurance, not only for their own spacecraft, but for everybody else's spacecraft on the launch and the launch vehicle and the launch site, uh, there just would not be enough insurance to go around because there is, there's only a teeny weeny um, relatively speaking, amount of insurance available for a particular mission. Uh, so it would not be possible to have a launch industry or a private space industry if, <clears throat> if, we, if we manage things in the old um, fault-based um, manner that we're used to seeing on Earth. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that's why a different way had to be found. Now, Cecile, you mentioned this already. <clears throat> uh, what the space industry came up with essentially was what we call cross waivers of liability. Um, and that is a, um, a series of clauses which in the United States are actually mandated, they're compulsory. Um, in other um, countries, they're just implemented contractually, um, which protect participants in space missions from each other. So let's just say everybody who was uh, a panelist um, was, uh, was launching on the same mission, um, except that Laura, you're the launch provider, okay? Um, but, but Jerry and, and Cecile and I and Elena and Marissa and Elena and, and Torsten and, and Stefan, we've all got spacecraft on this, on this launch vehicle. Well, the, the the, the launch services provider, that's Laura, she is going to require all of the rest of us to sign a cross waiver of liability, which says, if there is a big explosion, number one, no one's gonna sue the launch provider. Okay, goes without saying. Number two, no one's going to sue another participant, even if they've been negligent. So. We're not going to complain if Jerry was negligent. We're not going to complain if Donna or Cecile was negligent. We're all going to buy our own insurance if, if we choose to, and we're all going to take our own bat and ball and go home. Boo-hoo, I lost my satellite, but no one will sue anybody. Um, if there's a, a third-party loss, that's going to be another, another issue altogether. 
And not only do we not sue each other, but we make sure that our own, everyone on our side of the fence, our own investors and end users and customers don't sue Laura or Jerry or Cecile or, or Donna or Stefan. And so that's how cross waivers work. Um, even, even if we've made a, 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 a terrible, you know, negligent mistake. Okay. Oh, it's a bit rolly. Okay. So what that means is after launch, before launch, uh, there might be a number of, or before getting to the launch site, there might be all sorts of fights and arbitrations about uh, whose fault something was. Once you get to the launch site, and particularly once you get into space and at launch, the focus is more about time and less about fault. Um, and so uh, I won't keep talking for too much longer, but um, uh, because I know that Laura wants to get to some questions, but um, what that means is that, that co the con commercial contracts need to focus a lot about when risk passes um, in the spacecraft. And there needs to be a lot of focus on whose insurance will cover the loss. Oh, okay. Um, the summary of all of that is the end result is there's only one thing you remember from this, and that is if you are doing anything in space, do not use a terrestrial contract. Do not pick up some standard form contract and think you can uh, uh, do a space mission using a standard terrestrial contract because there's going to be all sorts of things not only do they not work in space, but they do the opposite of what you want to happen in space. Because if you start having fights about fault, uh, the entire mission could be put at risk and it, the whole thing could be uninsurable. So uh, uh, I mentioned, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop over some of these things because we could probably talk until the cows come home, but just to summarise, um, there are some jurisdictional, once you, if you're getting into a, uh, a dispute in space, um, of course, you can't necessarily fix it. There may be jurisdictional um, issues that need to be resolved, um, perhaps by looking at the National Space Register or perhaps by looking at the contract. Enforcement of decisions across borders is, of course, complicated. Uh, I mentioned that space uh, missions are... Um, or space activities are often, it's a dual use zone. In other words, both civilian and military. That means that a lot of technologies are highly confidential and export controlled. Um, and when you have a, a dispute that can, the access to information and the control of the information um, can be super tricky. I don't know why it's just jumped down on me there. Um, but it means some very um, tricky measures need to be need to be taken um, in order to protect the information and export control. Uh, hmm, for some reason, my uh, PowerPoint has booted me up. There we go. Okay. Um, which, when you think about it, a lot of um, uh, IT systems and everything have follow the sun um, access or uh, um, there's, there's a lot of access by um, administrators of IT systems that can um, wreak havoc when it comes to um, protecting ITAR controlled or export controlled information, which needs to be kept into account, taken into account when you have an arbitration because the arbitrator and everyone involved needs to uh, be complying with all of that. So I think I will probably stick to that except just four quick points to finish on. Um, large aerospace companies, um, you know, we, we do, it, as a myth advisor, we, do, we deal with very large transactions that are in the billions and we deal with very, quite small transactions for startups. The large aerospace companies, no brainer, they tend to use arbitration clauses um, uh, in, in contracts. Um, in practice, as Cecile pointed out, Arbitration is um, very expensive. It can be, it might be quicker than being in courts, but it can be too slow for some disputes. Um, and particularly when you're talking about um, for startups or for fixing either 
uh, questions that need a very quick and cheap resolution during a program that you where you can't afford a delay. Or if you've got small companies, two small companies, what are you going to do? If you do an international arbitration, the arbitration itself will ruin both companies. So we need to find something else. Mediation is one way. Sometimes um, for um, smaller matters, we use cascading clauses where we use expert determination. So we appoint an independent expert. Um, we make it very quick, very dirty. It may not be enforceable, but it's better than no solution at all. Not perfect, um, but sometimes it may be the best thing. Um, new space companies are actually finding that that uh, uh, there are advantages to, this, to mediation and expert determination, for example, because they do enable you to uh, maintain relationships and keep the mission going, keep the cost down. But um, of course, there's a lot of advantages to arbitration too, especially if it's worth a lot of money. Um, I will stop there because there is there are so many questions that everyone's going to want to ask. Everybody. Yes, thank you very much, Donna. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you do think that arbitration is useful. Same goes for Cecile. It's interesting to see that arbitration is on the mind of um, space industry professionals and that, that you do consider it in space contracts. Um, I, I will um, move on to, Mar to Mar Marissa um, and then we can go back to questions. And I think, Marissa, this is not an easy task, but there have been quite a lot of questions with regard to the applicable law, the seat of an arbitration, the enforceability. Cecile has already answered some of them in writing, but I think maybe you can cover some of those answers as well um, in your presentation. Sure. Thanks, Laura. So, um, um, so sorry, I will introduce you first. Oh, okay. So, so Marissa is an attorney in the litigation section of Holland and Knight. Um, in the New York office, and she also serves on the firm's directors committee, and she is the director of the New York International Arbitration Center. Her practice focuses on the litigation and arbitration of disputes arising in connection with international commercial contracts and transactions, and she represents clients in all phases of the dis dispute resolution process, drafting and advising on dispute resolution provisions, the analysis of claims, pre-dispute settlement negotiations and mediation, arbitration and litigation and post-judgment recovery and appeals, um, in, including in the space sector, which is why I have asked her to join us today. So now I think, Marissa, we, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So when Donna, um, Donna asked the question, if there were people in the audience who were not space lawyers, no, I would have put my hand up halfway. And I say that because I've been doing international dispute resolution for more than 30 years. And um, I've, my practice has spanned uh, a variety of, of areas. I started with maritime disputes, um, oil and gas. I've done some aviation. So it kind of made sense to go to the next frontier, so to speak. Um, and my experience in space arbitrations is, is in, on the insurance side, um, representing insurers. But when we talk about, Laura, Laura asked me to talk about um, whether dispute resolution mechanisms can help manage risk in, in space contracts. And when you think about space disputes, I mean, my, my first thought was like Star Wars, you know, are we, are we dealing with, you know, people fighting with sabers or, or things like that? I mean, what are we talking about when we're, when we're thinking about resolving space disputes? We've heard a lot about that today, but if you think about the types of disputes that can arise, um, commercial satellites, they're, they're contracts that, that cover, in, co uh, that cover uh, how they're designed, manufactured, selling them, launching them, and insuring them. And disputes can arise at any you know, part of this process. Um, we've got space tourism. Is space tourism similar to, for example, um, you know, tourism on cruise ships? You've got certain things that arose as the cruise industry developed. You, uh, you saw um, arbitration being used more and more frequently, unfortunately, on the backs of little tickets that you know, folks didn't realize that they were agreeing to arbitrate when they set, forth, uh, set foot on a cruise ship. But in space tourism, are you going to have, if there are claims that arise um, as a result of that, will they be subject to arbitration? Um, all of these areas have the potential to give rise to dispute. I read a recent article that said parties from 75 countries, different countries own satellites in orbit. And so as this industry grows, the, 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 the speculation, it's not speculation, it's just, it's inevitable that disputes, um, we'll see a, an increase in disputes 
Um, and how are those disputes going to be resolved? Um, so the question is, is there an efficient dispute resolution mechanism for private parties in international space law? And I guess the reality is not really. Um, there isn't a, a mechanism. I mean, we have arbitration, but it's it, it's one that isn't doesn't efficiently address space disputes from the point of view of private parties. So out of the five um, international space treaties, only the 1972 convention um, provides for, uh, for a clear dispute uh, mechanism. And if that's in articles eight and nine of the, of the convention, um, we do have provisions that address a, a process for trying to resolve a claim. But as I think it's already been mentioned, private parties don't have direct access to this dispute resolution mechanism. Um, an injured party would have to go to, uh, to a state to, to present its claim through diplomatic channels. Um, of course, that would add burden to this dispute resolution process. Um, and just sort of in, in digging into why that may be the case, I think it's because under the traditional framework of space law, space was viewed as being reserved for governmental activities. And now, um, you know, that's certainly not the case. Um, there's a lot of uh, commercial activity going on. Um, the, the, the other issue with the liability convention is that the outcome is not certain because the dispute resolution uh, mechanism offered under the convention isn't binding. Uh, it's also unclear how that type of award or decision would be um, enforced or could it be enforced. And finally, that mechanism under the convention only applies to harm caused by space objects. And obviously that's just a small part of what we're talking about here today. Um, I haven't had a chance to read all of the questions, but I know that there were questions raised about um, courts using courts to resolve um, disputes versus arbitration. In theory, you could take space-related claims um, to domestic courts. There are obviously issues that could arise with respect to um, getting jurisdiction, the language, possible bias, just as in any other um, practice area. Um, parties don't want to give up the home court advantage or they don't want to be um, trying to resolve a dispute in a court that's foreign to them or that they may believe is biased against them. Um, it may be difficult to determine the appropriate jurisdiction. Um, if you have a contract that sets a jurisdiction and parties have agreed to submit to that jurisdiction, that might work. Um, if you don't have that, you could have jurisdictional issues, particularly when you're talking about something that happened in space. Um, if you're dealing with a state agency, you could have issues of sovereign immunity. Um, domestic judges may not be familiar with uh, space issues. They may not be as adept at handling the technical issues that you may find with arbitrators who have developed the expertise over the years. Um, and you will also have issues with confidentiality um, because most courts, certainly in the US, decisions are, are public, they're published. Um, so we talk about including arbitration clauses um, in in space contracts. Uh, I think it's it's been discussed to some extent here today that international arbitration um, gives the parties to a dispute significant autonomy um, over their proceedings. So in international arbitration, parties are able to select their arbitrators and therefore they can look at the backgrounds of the, of the potential candidates. They can pick someone who has the expertise or the experience in the particular area. Um, in, for example, in the insurance context, we were able to choose arbitrators that had, um, they, they had a, a, a varied background. One arbitrator in particular had the space background, but we also had a former judge who had decided a, a, a number of cases in the, I mean, he had a ton of cases um, in the insurance context. And it sort of, it, 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 that's the kind of thing that you wanna look at when you, especially when you have a three-party arbitration panel. Um, arbitration gives you that ability. When you are going to a court, you don't, you get the judge that's assigned to you, at least in the US, you're not able to um, pick a judge. Certainly in the maritime context, there are some countries that have special maritime courts. We don't, not in the US, we have maritime arbitrations where you can, you can pick specialized arbitrators but with a court, you you get the judge who, you know, whatever the role says, that's who you get. Um, we um, also in sorry in um, 
with with space arbitrations as with others industry specific arbitrations there may be non lawyers that you would want to put on the panel um in, in our in our in the case that the, my most recent case we did have an arbitrator who was was not an attorney but again he had this specific space ex expertise um it's it's interesting because there are other areas where we have seen the rise of industry specific arbitrations i mentioned um maritime we have employment arbitration construction insurance um, FINRA in the U.S., which is securities arbitration, sports arbitrations, and all of those, you can appoint arbitrators with a specific expertise. And that in, in space arbitration, that, that it gives the parties the same advantage. Um, in addition, parties can choose the place where they might, where they want to arbitrate. You can put that in the contract. Um, it can be in an insurance contract. It can be in, an, in, in a commercial contract. Um, they can choose the language of the, of the proceedings. Um, and they have a lot of autonomy over the scheduling of things. And that's one thing um, I know for the sake of time, um, I'm, I'm going to try to sum up here. But uh, every, a couple of uh, speakers have mentioned ITAR. Um, ITAR does add a lot of complications and time to an arbitration. But you would have that in a, in a court proceeding as well. With ITAR, you do have to um, allow for the extra time that will be needed for uh, review of, of your of, of the process of what's going to happen, what information is going to be exchanged. We spent a fair amount of time negotiating our technical assistance agreement. We had to submit discovery for re review before it was um, exchanged with, with the other side, before we shared it even with some of our own clients who were foreign-based insurers. Uh, we had an expert that was from Canada. We had to um, be very careful about the, the type of information that we showed. We had to have approval for everything. And in the actual hearings, we did have someone sit in on, on a couple of days. And then um, the, the, the process was such that we, we were allowed to proceed without anyone being there. But the court reporter had to record everyone who came into the room, everyone who left during a break when we came back. Um, but that became very manageable in arbitration. In a court proceeding, especially one that was open, I'm, I think it would be very difficult to manage that. I think a courtroom would have to be sealed that might present difficulties for a judge. So I do think that arbitration um, gives a lot of flexibility, a lot, the ability to select the expertise of the arbitrators. And the final thing that I will um, I will mention is the enforceability, because I did see a question pop up on that. Just in my 30 plus years of practicing law, trying to enforce a US judgment anywhere outside of the US is incredibly difficult. With the New York Convention, which allows the recognition and enforcement of arbitration awards between signatory countries, it's, it's, actually, it's much easier. So if I were, when, when I counsel clients on cross-border disputes, um, I, unless there's a peculiar reason why not to do it, I recommend ar arbitration um, when I'm dealing with New York Convention signatories. Um, and with that, I think uh, there was there was a, um, an issue. Uh, I think one of the speakers mentioned that arbitration can be slow. It, it can be, um, especially if ITAR is involved, if you've got a U.S. entity involved. But I, I will say this: a lot of the international um, arbitral institutions, such as ICC, ICDR, have put in, in these interim measures or emergency relief, and they are things that parties are increasingly taking advantage of. If you have a dispute, um, a startup company or smaller companies that need to get an answer to a question right away, um, there are ways in which those questions could be presented on an emergency basis or to get interim relief that might help out in, in a dispute. Um, and with that, Laura, I'll, for the sake of time, I'll stop there. Yes, thank you very much. I, I wanted to ask Cecile if she if she wants to add something on the enforcement issue, because I think you, you mentioned that this would be against um using like an argument against using arbitration. I was just wondering if you if you could uh, tell us why you think that. Okay, uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, uh, yes, it's true that with the uh, New York Convention, it is easier to uh, enforce uh, arbitration uh, decisions. Uh, but uh, in my view, uh, you still need to um, revert to the national courts to have the enforcement. So it means that you, you still, uh, you have a second step 
uh, in fact, uh, to get uh, to get the enforcement. So that that was much more what uh, what was behind my uh, my mind when I said that. And I, actually, I, I needed to find some. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, contra uh, arguments anyway. I'm not surprised that Jerry wants to <laughs> to chime in on this. Sorry, thank you. I, I don't want to um, chime in so much as to just say that this is not contra arbitration, uh, but in my day job, um, the Deputy Secretary General of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. And in July the 2nd on 2019, we concluded the New Judgments Convention. And this is a brand new convention for the recognition and enforcement of judgments across borders, which means that countries that sign up to this uh, agree within that framework um, to re recognize and enforce judgments from another jurisdiction. Uh, it's just and it will enter into force very soon, actually, in September 2023, with the accession of the entire European Union without Denmark, uh, Ukraine, uh, and so on. So we're expecting more people to sign up. I know the United States is also probably uh, looking into this, um, but it is something quite interesting because it will allow the circulation of domestic judgments for recognition and enforcement um, elsewhere in other jurisdictions. Uh, the entire European Union already has, uh, has succeeded, so hopefully that, that means that there will be also more impetus for other countries to look at it. Thank you, Laura. If so that works, one, that would one. be great news. If it works, that would be great news as someone who has spent years trying to enforce judgments in U.S. judgments in um, other countries, but thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a culmination of 20 years. So hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, you know, we'll get there. Although it takes away one of the advantages of arbitration. But yes, I agree. It's it's a great development. Um, and I have one one last question before before we end, um, maybe for Marissa and Donna, um, with regard to insurance. So I, I read recently that there's less insurance available in space these days because of the increased collision risk. So I don't know if you if you could comment on this. And also, um, I was wondering, Donna, for example, would you would you say that insurers would be um, in favor of including arbitration clauses in 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 contracts, just also as as a way of mitigating their risk to have an efficient dispute resolution mechanism available, or would you would you say this is not one of the considerations? Thank you. That's a good question. I, I haven't actually had insurers comment on that to me. Um, Cecile may know better, but but I, I do know that um, they are they are certainly they certainly look very closely at um, whether risks are managed appropriately in the contract in the first place. So, for example, if 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 we're not seeing risk passing in a smooth way, if there's a lot of potential for disputes, then that could potentially in, increase the costs of the insurers if, if they're likely to end up in a big piece of arbitration or litigation or some kind of dispute. Um, but uh, it's, it's a good question. In terms of the uh, um, availability of insurance, it's, uh, you know, a little while ago, Swiss Re exited the market um, it, it's, it's, um, and that, that meant insurance became less available. If you have a number of launch failures in one year, the cost of insurance goes up because the amount that's available tends to go down. So it, it, it can be quite volatile. Um, so if you're placing insurance for a big program, you need to just follow that very closely, work with a very good broker and place it at exactly the right time is my tip. But I'd, be interested to know the views of others on that on those questions. Yeah, I don't know, Stefan, Cecile, if you would like to comment from your point of view, and Marissa, sorry. Uh, yes, if I can uh, jump in, if you, if you don't mind, uh, with respect to the uh, to the insurance market, it is true that uh, there have been some uh, several insurers that have uh, left the uh, the space market. So uh, de facto, the, the capacity uh, offered uh, is decreasing. Uh, so Donna said it, and uh, that's right. But uh, also, it is true that uh, for the low Earth orbit uh, insurance. The insurers are providing uh, less capacity. The, the, they, they will stay uh, on the market, but uh, they, they will reduce their capacity, uh, and and they 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 will also have a 
close look to risk collisions. So uh, it, it was not a, a really a subject for the insurance markets back in five or 10 years ago, but now it, it started to be a, a point of concern and the insurance might have some um, constraint uh, in capacity or uh, exclusion, uh, scope of cover, whatever, uh, because of uh, the, the risk linked to, uh, to collision. That's right. Uh, with respect to um, arbitration in contracts, so, so first of all, I want to say that in insurance contract, there is usually an arbitration clause uh, to settle the dispute between uh, the insurer and the insured, and that uh, what uh, the, the brokers try to do uh, is uh, to um, uh, to copy past uh, the arbitration clause uh, in the insurance contract from the satellite procurement contract. So that in case there is a, a, a litigation, uh, usually it involves uh, a problem with the satellite. Uh, and, and then uh, the insurers, they, they, they prefer to have the same forum uh, than for the, the procurement contract. So that's what I wanted to add. That's very interesting. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add something on this? Um, maybe so everyone here, obviously, including you, uh, the host, uh, know better about arbitration than myself. But I think um, with regards to the insurers themselves, one of the problems they have or, or why they're pulling out as well is that there is not a lot of um, predictability as to what's going to happen. So the risk assessments right now are, are very hard to achieve. And this is, of course, where companies or systems like ours are, are trying to mitigate it a bit and, and also enable them uh, insurers to come in again and, and start insuring satellites in orbit. Thank you. And unless someone else wants to add something, I think this is a good way to close. What, Marissa, I don't know if you want to add something. No, I, I'm in agreement with what, what Donna and, and Cecile and Stefan have said. So we, we can see that there is a role for arbitration in space disputes. And um, maybe if we see more disputes, there will be more space arbitrations. And I think with this, we can close today's session and our 2022 space arbitration series. And thank you very much for joining us today and already a very happy new year and happy holidays. And I will hand over the microphone to Elena for her closing remarks. Thank you very much.